Hello, and welcome to part two of our video guide to the 2017 Total Solar Eclipse. I'm Mark Nussbaum, your host and author of the best-selling book, Total Solar Eclipse 2017, Your Guide to the Next U.S. Eclipse. In this video, I'll discuss what causes the eclipse, where to go see it, what you will need to view it safely, and how to get the most out of your experience. So what causes a total solar eclipse? It's simple. The moon is constantly projecting its own shadow out into space. And every so often, when that shadow hits Earth, we get a solar eclipse. Now for this to happen, the sun, moon, and Earth must all lie in a straight line, and they must also lie in the same plane. Think of this plane thing as having them all sitting on the same tabletop. If they are not in the same plane, the moon shadow would miss the Earth and just shoot off into space. So when everything lines up properly, we get one of two types of solar eclipses, either an annular solar eclipse or a total solar eclipse. Let me explain. The shadow has two parts, a broad grayish outer section that spreads out into space and a smaller, very dark inner shadow called the umbra. The umbra narrows down to a point, like a sugar cone, as it reaches towards the Earth. We get a total eclipse if the tip of the cone falls on the Earth's surface. But since the moon's orbit is elliptical, Oftentimes, the moon is too far away for the tip of the cone to reach us. When that happens, we see what is called an annular eclipse, as shown here. The sun is not totally blocked, and a ring of light, or annulus, appears around the moon. But on the few occasions when the moon is close enough, the umbra reaches Earth, and we get a total solar eclipse, like the one coming up this summer. If you are far away from the umbra on eclipse day, only part of the sun will appear blocked. As you can see from this map, the closer you are, the more the sun will appear covered, and the darker the sky will get. If you stand directly under the umbra, you will see totality. So two questions arise. Where along the eclipse path should you go, and how close to the exact center line of the umbra should you be located? Let's tackle these questions one at a time. The umbra will sweep a 60-mile wide path from the west coast of Oregon to the east coast of South Carolina. Let's imagine you were standing somewhere in the path of the umbral shadow. First, when the moon's edge just meets the sun, we have what is called first contact, the beginning of the eclipse. Next, the moon slowly slides over the solar disk until a crescent sun is all that is left. This takes about an hour. Shortly after comes second contact, which is when totality officially starts. About two to two and a half minutes later, third contact occurs and totality is over. Then the moon takes another hour or so as it slides out from over the sun. The eclipse ends at fourth contact. By the way, while the term contact is used by astronomers in this context, of course the sun isn't actually touching the moon. It only appears this way as the two objects pass in front and behind each other. Notice that totality, the time between second and third contact, only lasts a few minutes. We refer to this time as simply duration. This map shows duration for points along the shadow path. Although duration changes by up to 40 seconds from the shortest to the longest, I would not make this a big part of your decision making. It is much more important to choose a location with the best prospect for clear skies. After all, if it turns out to be cloudy in your location, you can miss the event entirely. Now, the Umbra is about 60 miles wide, as I mentioned, or about 30 miles distant on each side of the center line. As you approach the outer edge boundary of the Umbra, duration falls off rapidly. However, around the center line, it falls off rather slowly. This is great news. It means you don't need to worry about being exactly on the center line. In fact, as long as you remain within 15 miles on either side of the center line, you will experience about 90% of the duration that a person on the center line would have experienced. The single most important factor in picking your location is the probability of having clear skies on eclipse day. Although we can't predict the weather that far out, we can make use of 20 years of historical cloud data from satellites and ground stations. The discussion that follows is based on the work of Jay Anderson, the Eclipse Chase's go-to expert for climate and weather. This chart shows select towns along the eclipse path and their average cloud cover in the month of August. Small numbers mean less probability of having clouds, so the lower on the chart, the better chance we have of clear skies and seeing the eclipse. The chart starts on the west coast of Oregon, on the left and sweeps eastward as we move to the right. 
For the Pacific and Mountain Time Zones, depending upon your viewing location, totality will occur in the morning between about 10.15 a.m. and 11.45 a.m. local time. So for these locations, the red line is the most important since it represents cloud cover in the morning. On the west coast of Oregon, you can see the effect that fog may play, making this a risky place to view the eclipse. Just inland from the coast, prospects get a bit better as you reach Salem, Oregon. Moving east, rising air on the west side of the Cascades often dumps moisture, so that the east side of the mountains tend to be dry and clear. Here we find one of the best observation opportunities in Madras, Oregon, just north of Bend. This includes several small towns immediately to the east, but not shown on this chart. As we reach the Snake River, the outlook remains excellent around the towns of Ontario, Oregon and the areas north of Boise, Idaho. Locations within the Sawtooth Mountain Range should be avoided, but again, on the east side of this range we have excellent viewing opportunities around the towns of Idaho Falls, uh, just north of Pocatello. Cloud cover probability increases as we climb the Tetons, but several groups have planned on observing from that area around Jackson Hole, Wyoming mostly due to the scenic nature of its surroundings and its proximity to Yellowstone National Park. On the east side of the Wind River Range and the Tetons, the weather prospects again get excellent and the towns of Riverton and Casper, Wyoming are favorable. Casper deserves special mention as the Astronomical League is holding its annual convention there, Astrocon 2017, the week before the eclipse. The cloud outlook for the plains of Nebraska is not quite as good as the western states, but still very respectable. Alliance, Nebraska looks good, however as you move east the cloud cover is likely to increase due to midday atmospheric effects as the ground heats up and air rises. Looking at the eastern half of the U.S., consider the blue line more important since in this part of the country totality will start later in the day between 3 and 4.45 p.m. local time. The center line of the eclipse will pass just north of Kansas City and just south of St. Louis. The nearby towns of St. Joseph and Columbia are represented on the chart and they show cloud cover in the 45 to 55 percent range. Moving east, we reach Carbondale, Illinois, the town with two unique special claims to this eclipse. First, it happens to be the location of maximum duration at 2 minutes and 40 seconds. Also, and by coincidence, the total eclipse of 2024 happens to go through Carbondale. Two eclipses in the same town, so close to each other in time, is extremely rare. For these reasons, several tour operators and conference attendees will be converging on Carbondale this year. The eclipse then goes through the center of Nashville, Tennessee, and I expect a big turnout throughout the city. Now stepping back, we can see that the best weather prospects are in the west, with the Plain States and Midwest also having excellent prospects. If your area is not in one of the sunny states, don't give up. I've been to eclipses where the outlook predicted 70% chance of clouds, and I still ended up with a great view of the eclipse. You just never know what's going to happen. You should check the weather forecast regularly as eclipse day approaches. You might even wake up on the day of the eclipse to find your area is forecasted to be covered with a solid deck of clouds. In that case, don't hesitate to hit the road and find a better location. Also, if you're located in the west, since it is summertime, don't forget to check for local fires. The smoke could easily obscure your view of the eclipse. Next, I'll show you how to use an online interactive map to pinpoint your viewing site and the exact time the eclipse will occur in your particular location. There are several smartphone apps that you can download to do this, but for this video I'm going to concentrate on a handy online tool that can be accessed from any web browser. To start, let's open a browser and search for NASA 2017 Eclipse Interactive Map. Here you will find a Google map with the overlay of the eclipse's umbral path and center line. Enlarge it. Then simply click on a spot you are considering and up pops what we call a local circumstance table. This is exactly what it sounds like. For that map location you have a table with all of the eclipse timings. C1 stands for first contact, the start of the eclipse. Then you have second contact when totality starts, and so on. If you don't see any numbers for C2 and C3, that means you won't be able to see totality from that location. Notice the table also indicates duration at that location as well. Simply click around to explore other potential viewing sites. One important thing, all these times are given in UT or universal time. This is the same thing we used to call GMT. 
Now to convert from UT to local time, simply subtract a few hours according to the following table based on the time zone of your chosen location. For example, C1 in Madras, Oregon is reported as 1606.43. Since Madras is in the Pacific time zone, we subtract 7 hours, so C1 will occur at about 9.06 a.m. The most important item to bring to any solar eclipse is a pair of solar filter safety glasses. You should have one of these for everyone in your group, kids included. You can buy these on the internet. Just search for solar eclipse glasses. The copper ones shown here with thin Mylar-like filter material can be found online for under $5. Choose ones that are ISO 12312-2 certified or ones that simply state that they are ISO certified for solar use. Here's how to use them. Whenever you look at the sun, even during the partial eclipse phases, always use your solar safety glasses. The only time you can look at the eclipse without solar filters is during complete totality, when there are no slivers of the sun that are visible. It is perfectly safe to look at the eclipse without the filters during totality. And in fact, if you keep these glasses on during totality, you won't see anything since the filters block so much light. Now, as totality ends, and even a tiny bit of the sun starts to show itself, put the safety glasses back on to avoid any eye damage. Supervise children to make sure they are using their eye protection properly. Also before use, inspect your glasses to make sure they're not scratched or otherwise damaged. Remember, even if you stay home, you still need to use solar filter glasses to watch the partial phases of the eclipse. Do not try to use household items to block the sun. They will not be dark enough and you can damage your eyes. Here's a partial list of items to not use. Now what else should you bring on your trip to the eclipse? Well for comfort, don't forget to pack a chair, a hat, sunscreen, and a light jacket. Also, take a camera to capture all those smiling faces right around the time totality ends. I also suggest you bring a colander or a straw hat so that you can make projection patterns of the crescent sun on the ground. The kids love this. But the most important accessory to bring on this trip is a pair of good binoculars for each person along with a set of removable solar filters to go with them. Binoculars will really enhance your enjoyment of the event. You can find filters to purchase for use with your binoculars through a quick search online. By the way, solar filters attach to the lenses that face the sun. Don't use the cardboard glasses with your binoculars and never place any solar filter between your eye and the binoculars. The filters could melt a crack from the heat. Filters must go on the lens closest to the sun. The eclipse on August 21st, 2017 has perhaps the best weather prospects for a U.S. of eclipse in our lifetime, and there are many great viewing locations to choose from. For a complete guide to the August event, including maps and timetables, follow the link below to my book, Total Solar Eclipse 2017, Your Guide to the Next U.S. Eclipse. It is available through Amazon in paperback or in Kindle ebook format. Thanks for listening.